Ok. So we are just waiting a little. We yeah, are waiting we can wait. two or three minutes. So yeah, let's wait one minutes. or two minutes so that people can join in. Yes. Welcome to everyone who already joined. No, I saw a lot of. Yes. It was a lunch break, so you know, people always come a bit late after lunch break. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so more people coming. Okay, so Welcome everybody, um, um, Aris Bung from Liber and I'm just here as a technical uh, officer. If you have if there are any issues, whatever, you can use uh, the chat to ask questions. Uh, but I'm going to let the stage now to Nicolas Larousse, who will be chairing this session. And I think every speaker here to take part of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. Uh, so I'm Nicolas Larousse, I'm chairing that session. And uh, the idea is to present what we are doing right now in the short project, in the task, uh, um, doesn't matter, 3.4, sorry. And uh, the idea is to deal with that citation of data. And uh, this is a not very new subject, but maybe we need to, uh, to share different point of view of different communities about uh, the citation of data. And uh, this is the idea of this session. And uh, we will have uh, at first a brief presentation of, uh, by Jan Brazé about uh, the history of data citation. It's a short history, but anyway, it's history. And uh, after that, we will have three presentations from different, three representatives of three different communities and uh, so to, to show you the diversity of data citation. Uh, and after that, we, it will be open for discussion. Uh, and we have time because we can go until three o'clock. So rapidly, I'm going to share my screen to show you what we want to do in uh, our task. The idea is to have something for data citation dedicated uh, for, uh, does it work? Um, yes, I can see. we just see your screen. With... Okay. Yep, that's it. Is that, is that better? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So the idea is to, uh, to have something sp not specifically designed for SSH, but uh, something which takes into account the specificity of SSH. So the idea is to create citation from existing citations that you can grab from article for publications, for instance. And you have this kind of citation string. Uh, generally speaking, it's not very standardized because uh, you have every kind of way to cite things. And the first thing to do, we want to do is to enrich uh, these citations. And how can we enrich the citations? By trying to find complementary information about uh, from other sources of descriptive metadata from repositories, for instance. And also to have a possibility to give a human uh, annotation or machine annotation, if it's possible, just to enrich this kind of citation. And we want, after that, to put that in a sort of repository 
which we call a fair SSH citation. And it will be in a format, in a model, in a data model, which, we, which will be the same for all citations. Oh, sorry. After that, we want the citation to be actionable, if it's possible. So it could be used, of course, by human with a viewer, uh, as it's, it's uh, normal. But also, we want to make it actionable. This is the main goal of the task. And to, with this uh, actionability, we want to enhance and foster discoverability of resources in SSH. And of course, it's a discoverability of research and of course of fair digital objects. With all that, we want to do a repository for that. So we put citation in a repository in a standardized way, I may say. And then you have this possibility to have an API to get information, to get machine actionable and also to have a fair citation viewer. And the main goal maybe for after the, the end of the project is to have a citation, what we call a citation infrastructure. It mean, that means that it will be a federation of repositories using the same uh, data model and the same tools that we are going to develop in that task. And that's it for my presentation of the task. Thank you, Nicolas. So now I give the floor to Yann Brazé. You can introduce yourself and introduce. Uh... Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Um, my name is Jan Brazé. Um, I hope you can hear me because my connection is a bit wobbly at the moment, but I hope yeah, you will. OK, perfect. Um, so uh, I work at the University of Göttingen Library in Germany. I'm the head of research at the library, and we, uh, we are very active in uh, a lot of projects from the digital humanities and also other projects dealing with how people deal with information. We're also part of a shock project, so that's why we also are involved in the work package three that um, Nicolas was just mentioning. But I'm, um, I'm delighted to give a short introduction to the topic of data citation because I was um, actually involved in one of the first steps in what we nowadays see as data citation. Um, the idea of, of having data citation actually, of course, is, is, a, is, a, is a pretty old one, but um, for, for decades, the problem was that the technology was not there to actually allow a, a useful method of, of data citation. And um, interestingly, it started more or less around 1999. That was also the time when the DUI system was firstly introduced in the publishing world. And all of you know that the DUI as a digital object identifier was something that revolutionized the way that we cite articles and papers. And, um, and parallel to that um, uh, coming up of the DUI system for publications were first discussions in the uh, science community about uh, introducing a system for citation of data sets. It started around 2000. Um, Firstly, as, as, a, as a mere idea from some scientists from the earth sciences. So why the earth sciences? Well, the, the thing is that um, when we look at data citation, we, do, we look of data, we also, the first thing that, that comes in mind is that there is a plethora of different data formats everywhere. And every discipline has a completely different way of how they deal with data. They have also a very different um, identification, what is data anyway? So if you talk about scientists from, from the humanities, from med medical scientists, chemistry and earth science, they all have different types of things that they call data. But the, the nice thing about the earth sciences is that um, the earth sciences always had a, had a very um, good way of dealing with data. If, you, if, you, if your job is to measure the weather, then you have to me measure the weather today because you can't measure today's weather tomorrow. So it has to be done every day and you have to collect this data, store it, make it available and, um, and make it freely available for other scientists. So you don't measure today's weather because you have a clear idea what you're going to do with this with data. You just measure it because it's there and it will be used by other people. And, and a typical use case in earth sciences is that people use data that was collected 50, 60, 70 years ago from, from completely other people. So that is a, a, a completely interesting attitude towards data that is very useful when we talk of data citation. So the earth scientists 
I came up with the idea that uh, wouldn't it be great if we could somehow um, use an identifier to, um, to, to cite data. And this resulted in a, in, a, in a project by the German Research Foundation started in 2002 as a pilot to just discuss possibilities. Out of this came a, came a first project and that was when I were involved in this project around 2003, when we were actively looking at a prototype um, infrastructure for the citation of data. And that included, for example, also to look at different identifier types. So at first we, we looked at the DUI system, looked at URNs, looked at handle systems, so any, any kind of persistent identifiers and, and try to analyze what would be useful for data citation. And, and pretty quickly, it, 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 it was clear that the DUI system was a pretty good technical system for, for data citation, last but not least, because it was heavily involved, already used in, in 2005 by the publishing industry. So many scientists were actually aware of what they were doing. And um, another element that was important in this is that when I started working in this area, I just had just finished my PhD and I worked at a, at a library, at the German Library of, uh, German National Library of Science and Technology, because the, it was very clear to the scientists, and remember those were all scientists from the earth sciences, that um, to register data sets, you need to have a neutral organization. You have to have some, some type of, of, of registration agency that takes care of the data citation. And that was naturally library. And I still believe that libraries play a very important role when it comes to managing information and providing services for scientists. And data citation, data registration actually turned out was, was one of these roles that libraries could play. Long story short, um, we started assigning DUI names to data sets 2005, 2006, 2007, mostly in Germany. And we built up a very nice system for German scientists mostly from earth sciences, other disciplines slowly came towards us and, um, and it worked pretty well. The, the, the scientists could actually give a DUI name to their to data sets and the data was registered and they could cite it using this, this DUI name. And, um, and then something interesting happened, which I still think is a, is a good uh, prototype for a lot of the things that we are doing. Um, we had this nice system that worked in Germany for German scientists, but we are all aware that, that science is something that is not the national thing. So um, it, it's not for the benefit of science if you have a good working system that only works in one, one country. So um, naturally, um, some data centers from other countries, from, from the UK, from Switzerland, approached us and said that, well, we would like to have DUI names for our data sets as well, because we see our colleagues in Germany using it, and it would be great to have it. And then other libraries came to us. So the, the first were actually the ETH Zurich Library in um, in Switzerland and uh, in NIST in France, the, the technical library in France. And they approached us and said that we see what you're doing. It's, it's just that you assign DUI names for the data sets in your country and we would like to do the same. So just tell us how we can how we can apply for a DUI license from the DUI Foundation. And suddenly it, it, it was clear for us that um, the, the worst thing that we could do now was if everybody was setting up their own infrastructure for that. So because um, what we actually need was a joint approach. We, sh we should somehow work together. And, um, and that's how the idea of a data site was started. And the idea of a data site was that we just pick um, organizations, ideally libraries that can in their domains form as some sort of, a, of, of, a, of an aggregator and a, and a local agencies and support scientists with their need to have DUI names for data, data sets. And that's how data site was funded actually in 2009 in December 2009 in, in London, because um, uh, we, we actually, um, when, when the British Library joined us, the, that was actually the, the, the gravity that we needed to have a lot of interesting partners. And, uh, and from the start, we were very international. So when, when we started the discussion, we were only five libraries from Europe, but then we had some contact with um, colleagues from the US. And so Dataset started with seven members in, uh, in 2009 and with a couple of 10,000 data sets that we were registering. And, um, and then uh, it was a success story. It evolved and we had more and more members joining right now in 2020, although I'm no, I'm no longer involved in data set. Um, but data set now has uh, more than 190 members from more than 40 countries. And um, the last numbers I have is that they have registered over 20 million data sets with DUIs because the, the good thing was um, that the basic idea is pretty straightforward and pretty simple. It's just give a DUI name as an identifier to a data set so that you can, can use it. And 
And on top of that, all the other services just come up. So it gives the opportunity for, for commercial vendors who actually count citation and, and um, make some, some rankings or some, some indexes to uh, respect data sets as, as publications. Um, of course, it has, to, it has a lot of other issues that are probably only half solved or not solved at the moment. The, the most important part is that um, in the classical publication system, you have a peer review system, you have a lot of, um, of trusted um, reviewers, and in, in data publication, it's a bit more tricky because a uh, peer-to-peer review of data set is, is more tricky. So some of our data centers, what they did was they make some technical um, checking of the data set. If, if all the numbers, all the files are, are, are logically um, consistent, if there are no spikes that shouldn't be there. But still, it's a lot of manpower needed to actually make a real peer review for, for data sets. And, and this is something that's not, not solved yet. The other thing is that, um, as I mentioned in, in the beginning, everybody has a completely different idea what a data set is. And um, in, in shock, we very much look at humanities data and the idea of what a humanity data set is, is different than the earth science when they measure just the weather. But um, in, the, in the beginning, when we started data site, um, the thing is that we always, um, argued that um, anything is a data set. So anything that is motivation for, for further research is a data set. If you, if you create something in your research process and you, um, and you believe that this is, is, is worthy of being published, worthy of being shared with other scientists, and you hope that other scientists could be motivated by that and could find, get some evidence out of that, then this is a data set. And, um, and especially uh, if you really want to, um, to make, make good data citation, this of course includes to, to add metadata to the object, to, to find a repository to store it, to get the DUI or some other identifier. And so uh, the, the, the first hurdle always for the scientist was to, to actually do make this extra effort, do this extra step with your data um, if you believe that it's worthy of being shared. And, um, and it has been a success story, and I'm very, very happy that I was 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 a part of that. And I, I still remember, I said it in the um, in the prologue when we had, um, we started or I started doing this uh, in 2004, 2005, and um, and in 2005 we had already established the um, the system, and we started assigning DUI names to datasets, and um, and I attended a lot of conferences, and uh, I always had two questions coming up at the end of my presentations. The first always was, why do you care about data? So nobody has an interest in data and it's completely weird, especially for you as a library, to think that there is something useful in data. And the other question always was, um, why do you use DUI names? Why? Because DUIs belong to publishers, they're evil and they're commercial. And it turned out that in the last 15 years, this, um, this views, these views have changed. So people see that actually data is in many disciplines, uh, the core value of, of, of research. And, uh, and in some disciplines, people actually argue that, that the data is much more valid than the publication. And so that, um, that it's, 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 uh, it's a great um, thing that happened because um, when, when we started this in, in 2005, I remember that we were also talking with publishers and, um, and even the publishers had no interest in data. And I think that was a, that was a very very lucky situation because if if in 2005 the publishers would have joined forces and said that okay, we take care of data now as well, so we big, make big repositories, everybody drops their data, and then you pay a dollar ninety nine if you want to look at the data, and nineteen ninety if you want to have the full version of the data sets, then there wouldn't have been a lot of things we could have done with that. But because the publishers were not interested, um, organizations like DataSite and all other organizations had a, had a chance to actually build up open data repositories and, and, and provide the basic idea of open data that even though the, you have to pay for an, for an article, that the underlying data should be, should be free of charge. And, and that now is something that has changed scholarly publishing in a way. And also the ability to assign identifiers to that has changed scholarly publishing. And that was, that was a fantastic um, experience in the last 15 years to see how, how the, scholarly publishing landscape has changed from the first steps that we did to now we are not completely in heaven so it's not that everybody uses data citation everybody publishes his, his or her data but um in a lot of disciplines um data publication is, is a thing and people are doing it and people are used to it and especially the young researchers are expecting open data and that opens um 
the gates to something completely new because um, uh, another strength that we have, and that's also why, why the shock project is so, is so um, um, exciting, is that um, in, in many areas, the scholarly publication is a system that is the same for 300 years. And the whole idea of, of a journal article and a journal article being cited and the citation counts as some scientific reward is an idea that's from the 18th century. And um, it hasn't changed a lot. In, 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 there are some publishers who are more active than others, but, but in many disciplines, it's still the same model. And, and, and we see so many changes and the changes and about new e-signs, new ways of publication, new ways of dealing with data, sharing with data, working collaboratively together. And, um, and if you do that, um, identification of data and, and citing data is a very crucial part of that. And um, I think we have only just started to see new ways of working together, new ways of doing science. And, um, and at the core of it, the, the, the free exchange of data, the, the, the trustworthy access to data is, is an important part. And um, I'm very excited to see how what the next 15 years will bring, because I've seen what happened in the last 15 years, and I'm looking forward to the next 15 years. OK, thank you, uh, Jan, for this, uh, for this history uh, of um, data citation. And uh, we, in shock, during this project, we have done a lot of uh, research about uh, different practices about uh, data citation. And as Jan said, it's uh, very uh, diverse, huh? a lot of diversity, especially within SSH. And, um, so there are room for improvement, certainly, and we are going to provide the recommendation for people to, to, uh, to have the best way to cite data. And the idea after that is to be able to link data and publications, of course, and this kind of uh, cycle that is just beginning, as you say, Jan. Thank you. I am giving the floor to uh, Barbara Macking. Sorry, by giving it, and uh, so maybe you can introduce yourself and uh, give us practices of your community. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I am Barbara McGillivray. I am a researcher, research fellow at the Alan Turing Institute in London and a senior research associate at the University of Cambridge in linguistics. And uh, in the spirit of uh, historical overviews, I'll also uh, say that I have, uh, well, my PhD was in computational linguistics. So I'm a computational linguist and my research is on uh, modeling uh, the change in meaning of words over time. Uh, and um, I've also worked in, in publishing. Um, I was a language technologist for Oxford Dictionaries for a few years. Uh, so it's a very data-driven uh, part of, uh, of publishing, uh, dealing with lots of language, uh, multilingual data. And then I, I worked as a data scientist for Springer Nature. And now I am back, been back to full-time research for a few years. Um, uh, but I kept some links with the editorial uh, worlds. I'm editor-in-chief of the Journal of Open Humanities Data. Uh, which is a, a small journal, um, I'll say a few words about it, and um, it's a journal dedicated to data uh, papers in the humanities, so it's growing. Uh, uh, and I'm also data champion for uh, humanities at, um, at the University of Cambridge. So today I'm going to try and share my experience uh, from the point of view of my research and also my uh, editorial uh, involvement. I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, <clears throat> Can you see uh, slides? So we are here to talk about uh, fair, uh, fair data, and um, um, just to remind ourselves of the uh, of what fair stands for. Um, uh, the assumption um, is that uh, we want to make data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, especially because as humans increasingly rely on computational ways of accessing data. Now, this is something I can definitely identify with as a computational linguist. Uh, I just finished planning a, um, a project that deals with uh, meaning change in um, over a couple of centuries in, in British English. And we 
spent quite some time planning for all the different uh, data sources that we would be uh, looking at. And for each of these uh, sources, we're talking about uh, collecting uh, metadata and uh, building language uh, objects that can allow us to track how words change meaning over time. So that's definitely something that I see happening. Uh, but computational linguistics sits between computer science and linguistics. So it's only just about a humanistic background um, field in a way. So um, I'm going to uh, spend some time um, first talking about my work on data citations and then also my experience with humanities data. So um, at the heart of all this discussion is uh, the idea of, of sharing data. Uh, so once we, we agree on sharing data, we can uh, agree on how we best uh, share and, date and cite data. And, and I'd like to draw your attention on a specific mechanism of incentives that may uh, be a, a uh, hurdle uh, or something that slows slows progress uh, down in this direction. So we have different players in this landscape. We have the journals um, and the publishers who um, have their own incentives and who can uh, influence um, data citations through mandates, for example. Funders as well um, can uh, put some pressure on researchers to adopt certain uh, policies. And the researchers are on, at the receiving end of these pressures. They also have their own incentives to publish and to be recognized and credited. Uh, so there was a study that I did uh, with some uh, colleagues from the Alan Turing Institute and uh, ex-colleagues from Springer Nature. Um, Actually, Ian um, uh, basically launched scientific data, uh, the data journal Spring Nature, now he's at PLOS. And we uh, decided to look at um, whether uh, citing uh, data actually helps researchers from the point of view of getting citations. So we focused on data availability statements, which are those um, statements that um, appear sometimes in sections of articles. Uh, so you can see an example here. Um, so these are kind of bits of text that authors write to um, say where their data um, is. And we, we analyzed uh, half a million articles, uh, open access articles from um, PLOS and Vermont Central. We've collected H index in this data from for the authors and a, a bunch of other metadata on the articles and focused on uh, the years 2000 to 2015. And uh, we automatically categorized these data availability statements using some computational algorithm to identify whether uh, these statements are actually informative, if they are the, of the good type, in the sense that they actually contain a DOI, for example, um, some sort of precise link to the data, or whether they are um, not so useful. For example, they don't they say there is no data available or data, uh, data available on request. And what we found was that publishers make a difference in terms of uh, when they decided to mandate the presence of data availability statements, then we certainly see uh, uptake for, for, from authors. So here you can see, for example, in Biomed Central, uh, the red, ver uh, sorry, the black vertical line is the time when the publisher uh, mandated that all papers have to have a data availability statement. And then to the right after that time, you can see that in light blue um, uh, papers started to have these uh, sections, these data availability statements of different types. So not, not all of them do, but um, increasingly um, they do in similar pattern for uh, PLOS. Um, and then what we did, we also wanted to quantify the effect of having a data availability statement in, um, in terms of um, uh, determining the percent citations of a paper. So we fitted a, a linear regression model that basically tries to predict how many citations an article gets based on a number of different factors, including how many authors um, the article has, how many references, et cetera, and the field of research. But it, crucially, we included the, what, the presence of this data availability statement and its type. And we found that, um, that the presence of a data availability statement leads to up to 25% more citations. 
So um, the details are in the paper we published, but um, basically the takeaway message was uh, journals have been requiring data availability statements um, and the presence of these statements has increased over time, uh, which is a good thing, and they are, these statements are correlated with higher citations. So that uh, puts some, you know, gives some evidence to funders, publishers and authors in particular um, on the good um, effect of having these data availability statements. So we know that they help reproducibility, but now we also know they help uh, citations of the paper, it, uh, original paper itself. So um, why I, sh I shared this um, research with you? Well, because I, I believe that data sharing is the first necessary step towards fair data. Um, so, but we, we are here to talk about the humanities. So uh, the, the rest of my presentation will focus precisely on the situation in the humanities research. So I said I'm a computational linguist. And so my view is skewed in the sense that uh, it, this is a, 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 a and highly computational field, but I'm also I also work with other humanists, and um, specific, especially in the field of digital humanities, which is um, a broad uh, field uh, including um, various applications of digital methods in in, uh, in different humanistic disciplines. We see an uh, increasing adoption of computational methods, which range from just um, uh, doing um, uh, very basic kind of data processing to uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, modeling. And um, this is something we've also uh, noticed when we wrote the white, white paper from the Alan Turing Institute on the intersection between humanities and data science. Humanities, specifically data, uh, digital humanities, are becoming uh, more and more computational. This is also proven by a number of different initiatives, including um, the workshop on computational humanities research, which is actually happening uh, from Wednesday this week. Um, and I'm, I'm chairing the, the program committee of this uh, workshop. Um, and it just shows how there is a growing interest in computational methods in humanities research. But most of the humanities research, it really struggles with um, with uh, citing um, and uh, recrediting um, data work. So if we visualize the traditional research process, if there's such a thing, uh, we can imagine that we have a bunch of sources uh, of different types. We could be doing some coding, certainly some reading, some analysis, whether manual or computational. And normally this all ends up in the prose uh, article where the emphasis is on the analysis, the, the theory and the interpretation. So what's left out in all of this is the work that goes into research resource creation. So in linguistics, this is typically called corpus building. So a lot of time can go into collecting all the texts or the spoken language data or similar that um, unnecessary evidence sources for the analysis. And all of this has limited uh, room for kind of, um, cre crediting the, the uh, credit. Um, so that's one, th one problem um, in the kind of traditional um, way of, of um, uh, reporting uh, research. Um, another uh, gap is in the additional data sets that uh, get created as part of the research process. So uh, for example, it's very common in linguistics that we start from a corpus, but then we add some extra analysis on it. Uh, say we focus on a certain linguistic construction and we want to uh, specify um, whether the construction is about animate or inanimate animals or humans, for example. So we go through all these sentences and we add this uh, a layer of annotation. So all this analysis analysis um, ends up in a very, you know, very valuable data sets that often forgotten and don't receive um, credit in the traditional uh, paper publication. So um, to uh, answer and this um, need and to, you know, to meet the uh, the uh, the need of filling these gaps, uh, the data, uh, I believe the data journal can can really help. So the idea is that 
um, well, data must be well described before others can use it. Um, so, of course, sharing is important, but also describing the data is very important. Uh, data quality matters, of course, and um, if researchers share the data in a re reusable manner, they deserve the credit through citable publications. And as we heard before, uh, citing data is the first necessary step, but, uh, but the data paper provides an extra level of um, crediting and um, peer, uh, kind of quality um, aspect as well. So um, we can create a date, write a data paper about a resource we've uh, we built, and that means that we get credit for building, say, a corpus or a database. Uh, or we can also uh, publish a data set data paper about the data set we built as part of our analysis. Again, that way we get credit uh, for that. Um, for that work. And this landscape for data journals is growing. This is just a selection of the different journals. You find uh, quite a few in the sciences, but also a, few, a couple in the humanities as well. Uh, there are really only two that are specifically aimed at humanities data. Uh, one is uh, Journal of Open Humanities Data, the one I'm editor-in-chief of, published by Ubiquity Press, and the other one is published by Bro, the research data journal for the humanities and social sciences. Uh, so this is Joe, the Journal of Open Humanities Data. It was launched in 2015, so it's a very recent, uh, relatively recent uh, initiative. It's published 17 articles so far, so it's still um, small, uh, but it's growing uh, rapidly. I took over the editor-in-chief um, role last year, um, and it's been publishing, um, it's published more than, than ever uh, in its history. And what um, a data journal provides, in addition to data citations, um, uh, these um, main features, obviously it's open access. It gives credit for sharing data because um, as I just said, um, it just fills the gap um, in, that is left by the traditional publishing process. It's peer-reviewed, so um, that's um, an added um, element compared to the data citations. Um, every data paper which describes a data set um, is peer-reviewed. Um, and uh, the criteria for peer review um, are here. Basically, they insist on reuse potential and completion, completeness of description and sound methodology. Um, and um, it's also, of course, uh, there's emphasis on the potential for reuse because that's really important. And we also have um, a list of recommended repositories uh, where the data uh, should be uh, stored. So we have a growing list um, on the journal uh, website. Uh, as I said, it's still a niche space. Um, so this is the these are publication numbers for Joad from its uh, start. As you can see, 2020 is the best <laughs> has been the best year uh, so far. I've, I've been quite a, I've put quite a lot of effort into uh, growing the journal, and it's it's paying off. But it's still, as I said, it's still a you know a, a very small journal for the amount of data that is an analysis that is happening in the humanities. So we we still have a way to go in terms of getting and in giving incentives to ensure data sharing and publication, to make sure that that counts in researchers' careers. Uh, and uh, we have still a way to go to, uh, from relying on computational uh, processing of, of data and, and the need for, for fair, uh, fair data. So what can we do to facilitate uh, the adoption of fair principles here? I'm, I'm heading towards the conclusion of my presentation. Um, well, I, with my editor-in-chief hat and also my researcher hat, I think there are a few things we, we can do. We can definitely make it easier for researchers um, to access and to find repositories that are uh, of high quality public um, um, that ensure um, th that they store the data in a, in a kind of, you know, um, way that is future proof and, and so on. Um, we uh, also uh, can focus on those uh, um, fields where there is a strong community. So for example, linguistics is a, is a field that has a long tradition for uh, building uh, resources. We call them corpora, but they are really data sets. Um, and uh, we can also partner with traditional uh, journals to make sure that there is a, 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 a collaboration so that if, if an author publishes in a 
traditional paper, you know, traditional journal, they also publish the data um, as a data paper um, paired with a traditional um, publication. So um, I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion. These are uh, my um, email addresses and um, 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 I finish here. Thank you, Barbara. It was uh, a nice view of um, different, different types of view, your research and the research you have done on the adoption of data citation. I think it's an open door for, uh, it's a good topic for the discussion. And now I give the floor rapidly to Angelo because he needs to, to leave to teach. And uh, Angelo, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, but thank you, Nicola, first uh, for uh, inviting me to this session. I'm Angelo, Angelo Riva. I'm a professor of uh, economics, and I'm the uh, principal investigator of this uh, European project, Eurisperm. Uh, basically, Eurisperm, uh, I am professor of economics, but uh, I do economic history. So uh, we love uh, to uh, dig into archives, uh, looking for data and papers uh, explain, explaining how to read this data. Okay, so often economists uh, forget that this second part that is uh, crucial. Uh, so basically, uh, URIS firm. Uh, URIS firm is a, an infradev uh, project uh, that is, uh, it, in uh, its uh, design study phase. So basically the goal is to design a research infrastructure to uh, uh, collect, connect, align, harmonize, uh, and share data on companies, okay? Basically we, we look at the past, we try to collect uh, into archives uh, and uh, printed sources, and on printed sources data on firms, and we try to match these historical data sets to contemporary databases. If you wish to know more about uh, the project, please visit uh, the website. Well, uh, the issue of data citation. Uh, for the moment, uh, uh, it's not a big issue for us because at least we rely on the more or less standard practices uh, in the field of uh, economics. But uh, as far as we, we see the future of uh, our project of Euris firm, Tomorrow uh, we'll open many questions, uh, and uh, I would like to submit to you uh, a couple of answers. But please help us in refining these uh, these answers. Well, uh, today, Eurus uh, Farm is in the design study phase, so in practice it does exist just on paper and not completely yet. But uh, so basically, the data citation is based on the members' practices. So here you can see just a couple of examples from uh, uh, members of the consortium. Uh, our Belgian friends have already built uh, a wonderful database uh, on, Belg on Belgian corporations, the Scope database, and uh, according to uh, their website, uh, the data from this database should be uh, quoted as follows. See Scope Database at the University of Antwerp and the website. Uh, at the Paris School of Economics, we have put in place, uh, thanks to uh, a French founding, an important database, uh, database on all the corporation and all the issuers uh, uh, listed at the Paris Stock Exchange from 1796 to 1976. And we stop at this date because uh, uh, there is already a database for the period 1977 onward. Uh, so we have built this database with uh, a specific founding, the, uh, the founding of the ACIPEX uh, data for financial history, but we have opened the database to welcome data from uh, additional data from uh, other researchers. So basically, if the data you uh, get uh, are being uh, uh, entered with the founding of this specific grant, uh, the data must be quoted, uh, as you see, uh, the feed database, the Paris School of Economics uh, version, February 2nd, 2017, for example. Uh, we do insist a lot on the uh, version, 
but because it, it's a living database. We still work on, on the data, we harmonize, we call, we, uh, we correct, and so forth. So the data is almost uh, is very important. Uh, if other researchers uh, wishes to uh, diverse their data into our database, so the quotation rules imply the of the database and the credits for this particular research. And often it happens that the researchers have already requested a, a DOI number. So uh, basically, uh, we add the DOI, ref the DOI reference to uh, the uh, database quotation. Uh, of course, all the references to the historical sources are in the databases and in the documentation of the data. Okay, okay, because in economic history, in history in general, the historical sources used to build the data are crucial, so they must be uh, clearly stated and documented. Tomorrow, tomorrow may be more interesting uh, because the future of uh, URIS firm, for the future of uh, URIS firm, we, uh, we plan to switch from relationally closed databases uh, to a collaborative wiki on your own. So basically the idea is to connect all of the existing databases uh, of the member, of the members of, uh, of URIS firm uh, within a collaborative environment. Uh, free surfing, it means that each and everyone can look at the data more or less on the model of the database we have here at the Paris School of Economics. But just accredited person can log in to enrich, modify, correct, and so forth the data. So basically, uh, the challenge we face is the following. Uh, in the future, we will have uh, data modified and enriched by many persons. Of course, the technology allows us to register who does what, but what's about citation and credits? Uh, because if you imagine uh, a time series, you can also imagine that uh, four, five, six person have corrected and enriched uh, data within this time series. So basically, our working hypothesis is the following one, uh, quoting the data with permanent link, uh, links to the historical record related to the data, but the real challenge is the granularity. There is a granularity because, uh, uh, yes, as we were saying before, uh, imagine a balance sheet. Uh, imagine a balance sheet, uh, and uh, we know that historical balance sheets uh, are, <clears throat> it's also possible to improve the quality of historical balance sheets, uh, balance sheets of cooperation, of course. Uh, so imagine different person contributing to the same balance sheet, uh, how to give <laughs> the proper credit to the work of each and every person maybe it's a challenge we image we imagine we can figure out uh, uh, that these permanent links pointed to summary pages for aggregates and then uh, summary pages were all the details uh, of the contribution of the different persons uh, are uh, credited okay that's so much and please don't hesitate if you have to uh, idea on how to improve uh, our system uh, based on a collaborative uh, environment, please uh, uh, don't hesitate to uh, tell me, discuss with me, it's a big pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Angelo. So it's a very different landscape from uh, Barbara. You see, uh, you are dealing with kind of a very specific data and uh, it's a very nice project too. You have a look at the, at the website to see if you're interested in uh, this kind of uh, data and historical data from Brussels. And uh, if you have some questions, don't hesitate to put, that, to put a question in the chat. We are right now two interesting questions question from Elizabeth, but uh, we are now going to have the last presentation uh, from Ami. And uh, Ami is also part of the short project. And uh, she's going to present you uh, a project from Sciences Po Paris. So it's your 
Thank you very much, Nicola, for the warm introduction and also for this opportunity to participate in this session on behalf of Task 9.2 of Shock, which is a formal data community that has been set up for the ethnic and migration studies field. Um, as a junior researcher supporting and involved with this data community on a day-to-day -day basis, what I'm going to be doing is discussing SSH data citation in relation to the scientific work that we're doing within the parameters of Shock. So I'll start by briefly explaining and introducing what our data community is, and then move on to showcasing how data citation really comes into play for a recent deliverable that we achieved, which is the Ethnic and Migrant Minorities, EMM for short, survey registry. So as I mentioned, I work uh, with a data community that has been designed for the Ethnic and Migration Studies field, and this data community brings together various stakeholders of quantitative su survey research undertaken with EMM populations. So we have the survey producers, survey users, and uh, individuals involved with the curation of this data, all working together within this data community. And given kind of how diverse our data community is, uh, because the idea is to really break down the silos and, and work collectively on an, on an issue, um, we have a more or less formal structure in how our data community is set up. So um, first we have a, a team uh, called Task 9.2 of Shock, and we are a very small team. It's made up of myself, Professor Lara Morales, and a handful of uh, research assistants. And we're focused on participating and contributing to Shock on behalf of the data community. And we're focused on primarily coordinating and manage uh, the scientific work. We also have another group called Ethnic Survey Data. It's an international network funded by the Cost Association and it has more than 200 EMM focused researchers from Europe and beyond. And as a research network, uh, their primary role is to provide the intellectual impetus for our scientific work. And then finally, we have um, a third group called Fair Ethnic Quant. It's the newest to join our data community. And it is an open science project funded by the French Agence Nationale de la Recherche. And its main uh, role is to ensure the inclusion of the French surveys in the scientific work. I know uh, for many of you, just kind of, I just ran through a bunch of different acronyms and groups, but it's just to give you an idea of how um, our data community uh, has come together and that we are a very diverse group of individuals working collaboratively uh, with a specific type of data. So our data community, um, in addition to being very focused on the ethnic and migration studies field, has a common goal, which is to make quantitative survey data on, on EMMs more accessible and reusable to a wide range of users in Europe and beyond. So we're very much about making this type of data fair. And so within Shock, what we've done is planned for and identified two specific deliverables. The first is launching uh, the EMM survey registry, which uh, very briefly is a free online tool that is fair and will display compiled survey level metadata and we as the data community are the ones doing the collection and compilation of this metadata for over 800 quantitative EMM surveys that have been conducted in 30 different European countries. Uh, the EMM survey registry is still in development, but we have a live version already up um, and it is fully functional. It's just that we don't have the full 800 plus surveys that we have identified displayed yet. Um, and then the second deliverable that we have is um, something that we're more or less starting to work on and which is to test the feasibility of including these surveys that we will have for the EMM survey registry included in another tool called the uh, European Question Bank. Um, I just wanted to mention that just to, to highlight that our data community is tackling this idea of FAIR uh, by trying to develop tools um, that can be made available uh, to a, a wide range of users. So because uh, the EMM survey registry is something that is live and available for use, I thought it would be helpful to actually show you the, the tool itself and then talk through um, data citation uh, in relation to the tool. So let me go ahead and share my screen. That works. All right, so hopefully you are able to see my screen and what you see is what we consider to be the landing page or the welcome page of the EMM survey registry. What we have here is just kind of the very brief um, introductory information about what the registry is, who is involved and why um, we ended up creating this registry. So very much the same type of information that I've covered just now. 
We also have a section dedicated to the methodology that we as a data community have uh, designed and implemented. Um, and for us, setting up a really detailed methodological process was important because we wanted to be systematic and consistent and efficient in the way that we would be collecting and um, uploading the, the metadata onto this registry. So as you'll see, you'll have, we have all kinds of resources available uh, for anyone to, to view to really understand the level of uh, detail that we've gone into to ensure that we're putting together this registry in a systematic way. We also have here uh, the list of countries that are going to be contributing to uh, the registry. We have 35 different countries um, who have agreed to contribute metadata. Um, these 35 countries are primarily from Europe um, and they are those that have formally joined uh, the project called Ethnic Survey Data. So there is some logic as to why these 35 countries. Um, the countries that are in blue are the ones for which we have the metadata already displayed on this beta version of the registry. And I will, will mention here that although um, the registry does kind of have a European focus, um, it is set up so that in the future we will be able to include surveys beyond these 35 countries. Now we have finally arrived to the part that is perhaps most relevant to our discussion today about data citation, because this section really talks about how we thought about um, how the registry and its made it metadata should be cited whenever it's being reused by, by any user. Um, so the first thing that we've done is to actually identify a citation that we wanted users to use uh, for the registry as a whole. And we've generated this citation through Zenodo and it's listed explicitly here. So there's no confusion as to how we want our registry to be cited. In addition to citing the registry as a whole, we've also specified that whenever someone is going to be uh, using the metadata, that they also refer back to the original data producers. Um, so if you're going to be using a, the metadata for a survey about uh, Roma and, and France, then we want you to go back to the, the, to the actual data producers of that survey. And the nice thing is, as part of the metadata that we've compiled for the survey, we actually include the suggested citations for the data producers. So let me go ahead and show you uh, what that looks like. Um, I'm going to, I already have the tabs already open because of bandwidth issues. I thought there might be uh, some delay. So uh, ideally you would click here, access the EMM survey registry, and it would take you to this page here. And then um, this is where you would actually go about looking at the different uh, types of metadata that we've compiled. But I already have um, the example pulled up. So imagine that maybe you're reusing the um, metadata for this survey, Understanding Society, and this is a survey conducted in the UK. Um, this is a record uh, that we have for this survey. And as you can see, it's quite rich because we have 11 different sections um, and we have two over 200 uh, variables covered. But for the part specific to uh, the citations, you go to section nine. And here we explicitly point out who the data producers are, who actually owns the data, who is actually distributing uh, the data set. And then down here, we also provide the exact citations that the um, data producers themselves have mentioned in some type of documentation that we produce. So for this one, we have a clear citation for the data set. We also have one for the technical documentation. And we do also have an additional field where maybe if you had other kind of important publications, maybe it's a noteworthy uh, book that has been produced based on the, the survey, you would be able to include it here. So the metadata is very clear as to how um, the data producers themselves would like their own work to be cited. In addition to that, we have another section up here, section eight, and it's um, just specific to the availability of the survey in terms of uh, future research. So we include information uh, so you can quickly access uh, the data set, for example. So it's hyperlinked. So if you click on it, it sends you to the actual original source. We also, in whenever possible, try to capture the DOI in hyperlink format. It doesn't show the full kind of DOI hyperlink um, verbiage. We have this go-to link, which we understand it's easier for uh, just navigating the information. But if you click on it, um, I do now, it should direct you uh, to the actual source. All right, and we do this not only for the data set, but also for the uh, technical documentation, um, as well as the questionnaire. So again, we're trying uh, to be as explicit as we can um, about where you actually go and find the information and to provide the hyperlink DOI whenever possible. 
Um, I will also mention here that the, this record itself, we haven't at this moment decided to provide any kind of um, citation or a persistent identifier. Um, and this has been a deliberate decision on our part because as you can see, we're collecting a lot of different types of information about each survey. It's a rich kind of meta metadata that we're working with. And so um, we're, it's not necessarily static. Um, there's times where things that we might not know the answer to, um, we're able to find out later on. And so the record itself is adapted. And so because it's a rather live kind of record, um, for the time being, we haven't uh, found an appropriate uh, persistent identifier to use. So instead, um, we just kind of go through the citation process through what we have captured in section eight and section nine. And then we do in section 11, at least recognize the individual um, who actually produced this record. And then each time the record is updated, we do provide kind of a date. So it's clear um, as to when the record was last updated by us. Um, the final point that I want to mention, so I'll go back to the landing page of the EMM survey registry. Um, so because we're working with metadata, we also had a thought about how um, we want to apply any licenses to the metadata that's ultimately uploaded and shared on the registry. Uh, through consultations with GESIS as well as other SESTA data archives, we were strongly suggested to adopt the uh, Creative Commons CC zero 1.0 universal uh, public domain dedication with uh, the following text uh, accompanying it. Our community norms, as well as scientific best practices, expect that proper site credit is given via citation. Please cite both the EMM survey registry and the data producers when reusing the survey level metadata. So again, the licensing that we use, it was a deliberate choice and we want to emphasize the importance of uh, citing the registry itself, but also the actual data producers of the survey, uh, whatever uh, that you're using for the metadata. Um, so I think that's all that I wanted to cover in terms of the work that we're doing and how we've tackled the, the topic of data citation. I think what we're doing is a little bit different. We're not necessarily trying to come up with the uh, best way of uh, citing data, but, but focusing more on identifying what the best practices are and ensuring that uh, we're resharing that information through this registry. So I'll go ahead and stop my screen. Thank you, Ami. So uh, after these four presentations, you realize that uh, the magic of SSH is you have a real great diversity of a data set of practices of way to, uh, as, as Barbara said, you have corpuses, but they are data sets in fact. And uh, so, Maybe social science is a little bit more advanced that uh, humanities are in, when regarding the question of data citation. But uh, anyway, it's a, it's an open. I think it's an open uh, field. And uh, during for this session, I uh, I asked people from uh, dealing with uh, social media how they cite their data, their data, and they told me we avoid to cite the data because you know you have personal information generally speaking when you are dealing with streets for instance and so they, they said okay we don't want to cite the data maybe sometimes if there is an anonymization we we do that but uh, generally speaking we don't do it so thank you uh, angelo had to leave uh, because he was teaching sorry for that but you can ask him some question by mail or you can ask the question i'm going to uh from, uh, to ask him um, directly for answers. And there was there was two questions in the chat, uh, one for Jan Brasse and one for Barbara. Who wants to begin? I you, can, Barbara? I can, uh, okay, I can yeah. Yeah. because mine is more general. And um, so the, the question, if I see it correctly, is um, about the diversity of PIDs, which is a, a very interesting topic and something that I, was very much involved in the last decade. Um, so generally the thing about PIDs is that um, every PID system is better than no PID system. So that is that is a very, very main issue. And it, but it turned out that um, looking at the different PID systems, and I would like probably to highlight DUI, Handle, and URN, as from my experience, they are the most um, popular ones. Um, they both all have their strengths and weaknesses. And, um, and we found out that um, it very much depends on the use case that you want to have for your data. So um, 
the, the, the handle system and the DUI system are both based on the same technology. And the strength of this technology is that it's ubiquitous and you can actually resolve any handle, any DUI in any handle server everywhere. That's a big strength compared to UN. The UN system has the problem that if you want to resolve the UN, you always have to know exactly who assigned it and ideally they have their own resolver. Um, but the UN system has um, has a strength that it's very heavily involved in the library community. So to, to break it down and not to, to be too detailed, um, the UN system is a good system if you have your own infrastructure and, and if you expect that the people that want to resolve your PIDs will come to your site and will be part of your community and, and that no people from the outside want to resolve your URNs, then the URN is a good system. If it's, everything is in a, in, a, um, in a closed environment, I can probably also share my video. Um, the, the handle and the DUI system don't, are not different con concerns of, of technology, but they are very different in the terms of the overlapping um, trustness and the overlapping structure. Uh, in a nutshell, everybody can assign handles. You can go to, you can get a commercial handle license, and then you can assign 20 million handles to every picture on your hard drive, and then flood the internet with all these handles. And tomorrow you can all delete them, and you have 20 million handles going nowhere. Um, so, because it's also very cheap, and um, uh, so the handle is a good um, ID if, if you want to assign a lot of identifiers to a lot of objects. And there is a certain likelihood that you want to that you will change them, delete them, erase them uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a later point. The DUI, on the other hand, has the strength that there is an overlapping system of trust. So a DUI can only be assigned by a DUI agency that has to be part of the International DUI Foundation. And um, uh, when, when we started assigning identifiers and talked to the publishers um, what type of identifier they would include in their citation lists, it turns out that the publishers always want to have someone to blame. So if you have a, an ID in the, in the citation list and the ID goes nowhere, then um, the publishers are afraid that the author who clicks on a link that doesn't work um, will blame the publishers. So the publisher wants to know whose fault it is. So that's why publishers like DUIs, because the DUI has a clear chain of responsibility that if you click on a DUI and it doesn't work, you can always find out the end whose fault it was. And that's why publishers actually like DUIs for citations. That is the problem on the other hand, that if you sign a DUI to something, you are in principle not allowed to change it. So if you, if you publish something with a DUI, it, it will be there forever and it will not be changed. And this actually gives you a little hint of what ident identifier to use. So if you want to really want to have a data publication that is accepted by publishers that you won't change, and um, then the DUI is the best identifier. If you want to have an ID that goes to data sets and maybe it's a lot of data sets and you will probably change them, you just want to share them and have a persistent ID for a certain period of time, handle is the one. If you want to give identifiers to something that is, um, and, and you have a, and you believe that 99% of the people wanting to resolve the or using identifier will come to your page anyway, then probably the UN is a good solution because you might have the infrastructure anyway. So this is a brief breakup. I hope that helps. But anyways, uh, thank you, Diane. The landscape is uh, infinite uh, with uh, all these uh, PIDs. And it seems that the last two years, DOIs have, DOIs are uh, maybe the best choice. A lot of well, people actually, are using, I, I think see... we're currently trying to build up a system that actually uses handles and DOIs because um, I would say that from the from the life cycle of scientists, it makes sense to say that when you have a machine that creates a lot of data, you just assign handles for them on the fly whenever they appear. And at a later stage, if you curate the data, change it, take some care of it, merge it, then you might want to have a DUI for that. So my idea of an ideal system is a combination of handles and DUIs. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people are doing that right now. Yeah. You didn't mention ARC because ARC yeah. is more on the library side, but uh, it's also it's also very widely used, but more in the uh, library and uh, also in, uh, in the archive world, which, which was done for archiving, uh, yeah. in fact. Yeah, ARC is also a very interesting um, 
concept. It, it, it has the, the weakness is that it's not as accepted in the publishing world. And um, from my understanding, it also doesn't have the security concerning the, the, the responsibility and, and the, the, the misuse. But, and uh, and it's, it's also um, the problem with ARC is that it's, but I'm, that, that's my knowledge from, from some years ago. It also um, ask a lot of um, infrastructure solutions at your, at your part, whether the DUI system has the handle server and then, which means you can resolve the DUI in any handle server worldwide. And that's something that is not working with ARC as well. Thank you. And uh, Barbara, do you want to answer the question of uh, Elizabeth? Yeah, yeah, uh, with pleasure. Um, by the way, I learned a lot about handles in DOI. So it was very yeah. instructive. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so the question was, uh, in many cases, humanities data is an enrichment of collections hosted in archives, museums, etc. So for me, the big question is how these enrichments make it back and become interlinked with these sources, mater source materials. Do you have experience with collaborations between the GLAM sector and humanities researchers in this respect? So yeah, that's really an excellent question um, and one that it touches on a very current uh, topic of discussion and, and, and work. Um, so for, I can speak. First, as a, as a researcher in linguistics, we um, we normally try to work on, um, so a few years ago, I built a, a lat, a ancient Greek corpus using um, freely available uh, resources from digital libraries. And then we enriched uh, those um, texts with um, linguistic annotation. And uh, I, we made a decision to just publish the corpus with the an annotation. Um, and release it and as XML so we can always link back to the original text. So that's a, this a kind of choice that most researchers I would say would tend to do because it's it's the easiest. But that in that case, there wasn't a formal partnership with any library or, or archive. We just wanted to get the research done and that was what we decided to do. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually a co-investigator in a much bigger project which um, involves the British Library. So it's a project called Living with Machines uh, and it's uh, about an, um, analyzing various uh, library collections including the British newspaper archive from the uh, 19th and 20th century, early 20th century uh, to analyze the effect of the industrial revolution and mechanization on, on people um, in Britain. And uh, in that uh, project, we definitely have to uh, collaborate with the British Library. Um, we want to as well. And so the, the source data for that project actually digitized newspapers that were digitized by um, a private company. So we spent about tw two years uh, sorting out the agreement to get Get, uh, permission to use uh, their data, and then we are um, we are now planning to um, release uh, derived data sets. So there isn't an agreement to release the the original data enriched because we just wouldn't. Uh, be allowed to because uh, it's a commercial company. They make money. Uh, um, uh, letting people search the, these newspapers for you know, family history reasons. So there are lots of legal uh, hurdles, uh, basically. Um, but there's also a, a new uh, call called the, uh, that is now uh, kind of active in the Arts and Humanities Research Council of, um, of the UK. It's called Towards a National Collection. It's precisely aiming at uh, linking collections across uh, the GLAM sector uh, and, and basically funding research projects that uh, do precisely that. So we're definitely looking into it. It's just a very complex uh, topic and it one, it's one that includes, <laughs> of course, as you can imagine, legal um, agreements, etc. So sorry, it's a long answer, not a very concrete uh, details, but it's something lo we're looking into very hot topic. So more more on this to come in the next years. Thank you for your, your answer. So you realize that we are here because with Freya, for instance, because of course, uh, PID is the beginning of everything when we speak about data citation. But 
as you mentioned, as Jan mentioned, and uh, Angelo and Ami, and Ami uh, it's not enough. You need to have metadata. You have to have some enriched information to provide a good citation. And uh, Barbara, I have a question maybe for you. Uh, you mentioned uh, data journals, but uh, what do you think about data papers? This new thing is not so new, uh, to be frank, but uh, it's a little bit new in uh, humanities, for instance. And uh, as you have made a survey about uh, the uptake of uh, technology in a broad sense, uh, with humanities, do, do, do you think that it's, uh, you have a lot of use of data papers or it's just the beginning or do you see something? <laughs> yeah, well, so, yeah, so um, data papers, mm, in my experience, so, okay, we have data journals that publish only data papers and then there are some other journals that publish um, data description there's like the journal of cultural analytics they have a data sets section uh, i haven't done a study on on this for the humanities my study was on on biomedical research because there's a lot more data there but i can say that from the point of view of the journal of humanities data it's it's very it's a growing area but it's still very small so there's huge room for improvement i mean in linguistics we have journals like uh, corpora who are precisely aimed at uh, describing corpora so language resources of a particular type um but i think there's still a long way to go um it's i think as i say it's i think it's a question of incentives people don't see the point in getting um I mean, publishing a data paper because they, it doesn't count as much as a traditional paper. And uh, until data journals get you know, high impact factor or there is some sort of stronger mandate from the funders and the institutions to, to publish there, then it's, 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 it's gonna be hard uh, to make a case for it. Um, but um, yeah. Uh, it, the general open humanities that has grown more this year than ever before so i'm hopeful that uh, it will continue growing some other questions from participants or maybe i have a, I have a question not really a question but uh, because i know the situation but you know i mean maybe you can say a word about uh, the national french funding agency because now where they fund projects uh, they want you to provide uh, a good data management plan, which is quite new because it's just arrived last year, uh, I think. So maybe Ami, you want to say what about that? I'm sure I can. Brief I guess I can. <laughs> Not a trap. I'm, yeah, I'm by no means an expert on the Agence Nationale de Recherche and their uh, funding schemes, but I can maybe talk a little bit about our recent experience because. Um, as part of Shock, one of our partner projects is Fair Ethnic Quant, which is funded by the ANR. And um, as you mentioned, we are required to develop a data management plan. Um, luckily, at Sciencepo, we do have a lot of resources and experts that we can go to to understand what's required. Um, but it's been overall a very helpful exercise. And even if when we're working with metadata to really think about um, what our responsibilities are as researchers. Um, so our data management plan is quite detailed. It talks about you know, the process that we have gone through to, to collect the metadata, how exactly we're storing it on our own computers, as well as um, how the registry infrastructure is set up so it's secure and um, protected. Um, it, and it, so the whole process of developing a DMP is a, um, has really challenged us to think critically about what it means to work with data. Um, and overall, I found that putting together um, a DMP has been very helpful in, in making sure that the work that we're doing can be replicated, but also understood and be available uh, for reuse for, for others. Um, what else can I say? Uh, so because there is also, I guess, a, a national push to, to make uh, research more open and, and to adopt kind of the fair principles. Um, 
part of our work, which involves connecting with French stakeholders of quantitative survey data on EMMs integration. Um, it's been helpful in having these types of conversations because now they're already at least somewhat familiar or they've been introduced with the idea of what it means to make data fair and, and what the, the added value of that is. So um, it's, and it matters for us because when there's at least some understanding of what the fair principles are and, and what it means to make uh, research data open, uh, they've been more receptive of the registry and contributing to it in the future. Because um, the a point that I didn't quite mention in my speaking part is that the registry, while we as a data community have done um, a significant amount of work to, to populate the information with metadata, its sustainability rests on buy-in from um, the larger kind of user community, which is future data producers, data users, to add their own uh, metadata for any new survey uh, surveys that come out, um, as well as to help enrich the, the metadata that we already have. Because as I mentioned, it's um, we can only do so much based on the documentation that we've had access to. And oftentimes, the information can be made better when the actual producers of the, the survey are able to, to participate. Yes, I think you know, regarding uh, the conservative way of acting of the national funding agency in France, I think that it's a good move. It's, uh, it was incredible for me that uh, now they say, okay, data is important. And, and uh, Jan said at the beginning of his talk that uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the end of his talk, that beforehand, it was uh, common to, to have people saying, why are you interested in data? It's not very interesting. You're interested in publication because for your career, it's more important that to publish data, of course. But uh, we can see, uh, and maybe we are going to, I don't know, Iris, uh, if we are going to end this session, uh, we, we can see that there is an interest in data because all the publishers, the commercial publishers now are really interested in your data. Uh, mentioning, for instance, uh, Elsevier. Elsevier bought uh, a repository, which name is Mendeley. It's not only a repository, but they, they use it. Uh, they, they use also the part from uh, the repository. And uh, it's, uh, that means that uh, there is an incentive from the publisher to put your data at Elsevier. You know? That means that for them, data is important. Maybe uh, some other questions. I don't see a question in the chat. So maybe Iris, we can close this session. And uh, I want to thank yes, you. Uh, I want to thank all the participants and of course all the speakers. And uh, see you. Uh, maybe you can uh, you can see that PIDs are also very very, very important things because Freya is, was dedicated, the project Freya was dedicated to PIDs and the idea is not only to give PIDs to, uh, to data sets, but also to project, to people and try to connect all these things to build a graph. And uh, this is very promising, I think. We'll see in the future, but I think this is very promising. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, every one of you, for contributing to this uh, very interesting session. And thank you, everybody, for your questions and comments. Uh, there will be notes and uh, slides available afterwards. And also, uh, you'll be able to see again the, the this discussion online. So thank you all. And please uh, keep on enjoying this conference. This is very impressive. Uh center <laughs> with website. Exactly. Thank you very much, okay, everyone. You. Bye. I'm going to close it Bye. now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.